you in behalf of Jesus our Savior. Amen? So welcome. Glad to have you here. And we started the day off today in a wonderful way. It was a hot week. We had an outreach here, and we got to hear our praise team outside. Uh, on Wednesday night, it was 100 degrees, I think, right? 100 degrees. And they, they survived. They made it, right? But it was a, a wonderful event just because just to come out and see people get together and have the opportunity to do so, and also to see them come out and press through high heat temperature, you know, just pressing through something. Because a lot of times we just decide, well, this is uncomfortable, so we're not going to do it, right? And I think there's a lot to be said about that. We're grateful for it. A lot of fun was had. Had a wonderful morning this morning with our men's breakfast. And... Uh, and it was just one of those days where I was feeling like I got up this morning and I was just excited to get in here because I had a word I just wanted to share with the guys. You know, I had a word I wanted to share with the guys and I felt like, you know, what a good way to begin the day uh, on a thought that I think takes us somewhere. I think for us to understand, anytime we have a new uh, understanding of God, you know, maybe, maybe not new as far as it's in the Word, it's there in the Scriptures, but we don't see it. We kind of brush right over it, and as a result, um, it doesn't have the impact that it can potentially have if we get it, if we, you know, if we see it and we hear it. I asked the guys this morning, you know, I gave them the typical John 3.16 that you see at every football game and an outreach event, for God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, whoever would believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life, right? And I asked him this question, I said, why? Why? And so we get all these answers, the guys, to give you summary quickly, of course, that uh, he did that so that we would have eternal life. He did that so um, we would not go to hell. He did that, you know, we had various different, different answers. And the scripture that, that I shared with them that I just felt like it hit me in the head like a hammer. It's Jesus praying. It's chapter 17 of John. And it's, this, this is the chapter where Jesus prays for the disciples. Then he prays for those who will believe on their message. That's us, right? But before, as he gets starts out, it starts out, here's how the chapter starts. It says, after Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to those you have given him. And here's verse 3. And now, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true God, in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. Wow, I'm just going to tell you, that hit me like a, a ton of bricks. Scripture is, is amazing because, you know, we know it's alive, right? Scripture's alive. It's, it's God-breathed. It's like the DNA of God. But sometimes I'm reading a passage, and when I read a passage, it's like getting hit with a club. Boom. Knocks me in the head like, do you get it? Do you get it? It's not, it's not the get out of hell free card, Jesus re receiving him as Savior. It's not the, you know, you get to go to heaven and we got all these different. It's, listen, it, it, it's totally relational. It's, it's, he says, listen, this is eternal life, that they may know you, the one and only true God in Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. That's eternal life. So knowing him. Wow, that's heavy stuff. So we went into it, and I'm not going to go there tonight, but I just was just so excited about this thought to just get your mind wrapped around this, the reality. I shared some scriptures, you know, Psalm 139, and Kristen started to speak on it. Where could I go to hide from you in the mountains or in the sea? There you would be with me, you know, all of that. You know, you were fearfully and wonderfully made, right? He knew you when you were knit together in your mother's womb, all of that. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 4, where it talks about he called us out before the foundations of the earth. Knew you. I mean, big, big stuff. And so we're, we're chewing that up this morning. That's what we've got to take a look at and, and consider that how purposeful God is. 
how purposeful he is. And not only purposeful, it's not like you're a generic figure, you know? It's like you get a job for some place and you're, you're, you know, it's a corporation and you're a number, right? You have an employee number. They don't know who you are. You're a number, right? And, and, and so because of that, you know, there's no personal, you might have a personal manager might know you, so on and so forth. When it comes to the corporate picture, you're nothing. You're, re, you're, re, you're replaceable. You're like a big pen in their eyes. If, if this one quits right and get another one, but not with God. Right? Not with God. With God, he knows the number of hairs on your head. Amen? That is, and if you're bald, listen, he knew them when they were there. I've got to throw that in there because it's reality. But he knows there's not a sparrow that falls to the ground that he doesn't know. Amen? How much more important are we than they? So I'm on this thought. So we're in this Experiencing God Bible study, and I just get captivated by it. Every time I lead through this same Bible study, it's, it bamboozles me again. Because when you begin to, to look through a lens to realize you are not part of a landscape, you are a participant in a divine plan. Are you with me? You're not part of the backdrop. You're a participant in a divine plan. And the God of all creation knows you by name. That's mind-blowing. It's mind-blowing, and most of us will never, you know, digest that concept as a reality. They, you know, at best will think, well, maybe I know some spiritual people. I, you know, I know some people that trust God, and, you know, and I believe that God knows them by name, but I don't know that he believes me, that he knows me. Now, you're selling yourself short because he does. So I've got some thoughts tonight. I was just excited as I was going through this experience in God because I'm trying to just... So I go through and I refresh. Courtney walked into the office one day and I'm, I'm flipping through the book. She says, oh, you're studying. I'm, I'm, I'm just re-going through this book because every time it does the same thing. Every time it challenges my thinking to think on a biblical perspective about things that affect our lives and how we perceive them. How we perceive them, right? So this section that we're in right now it's talking about a crisis of belief, you know, when God challenges us to walk by faith. And as we do that, we step into a dimension that no longer is navigated by what I can do, but it requires him to show up. That's a scary place if you don't have faith. Amen? It's a cool place, though. It's, an, it's, a, it's, the point. it's a turning point in your life. It's where the game changes. The way we live our life is really a testimony of what we believe about God. Amen? If we believe that we have to do everything for ourselves, then we're going to be very uh, restrictive. And in, in, in a lot of times, relationships in our life, they've hurt us so bad. Human relationships are contingent on, on the way we interact together. Somebody loves you today, they don't love you tomorrow. Right? You did something, they don't like it anymore, so they're done with you. That's not that way with God. He loves us. So motivated that he put in place a plan for your life, and all we have to do is believe him to live it. And one of the things that really was mind-bottling this week that, that challenged my thinking and inspired where I'm at tonight is God's invitation for you to work with him always leads you to a crisis of belief that requires faith in action. And there you have it. Well, you let a preacher chew that up for all week. And you get what you got with coming to you. Because, you know, the things that we've been involved with here at Families of Faith, from when we were just a little church on Friar to who we are today, and all the schools that are opening up all over the place, are a direct result of us believing we're called to something that is so much bigger than ourselves, we cannot do it. But God can and so if we're called, what he, what he calls you to, he'll, he'll take you through, right? What he calls you to, he'll provide for. What he calls you to, he'll make come to pass. But you've got to meet him at that place. And so we're going to look at some scripture tonight. And I, and I think, you know, on the journey, I, as I read through the scripture, as I started to read it, I backed up and I'm like, oh, we've got to get a little bit more 
of, of an insight into what's going on here because these are just regular people like us. And they're stymied because, you know, they think through the, a natural man's mind. And they're emboldened when things start happening that are positive, that move in a way that looks good. They're emboldened, and when, when things look in their natural eyes like they're not good, then they shrink back. Sounds just like us. Sounds just like us. So anyway, here we go. We're going to start out in Exodus chapter 13. Exodus chapter 13, verse 17 and following says, when Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them on the road through the Philistine uh, country, through though that was the road. Oh, I'm sorry. Though that was a shorter way, God said, if they face war, they might change their minds and return to Egypt. So God led the people around by the desert road toward the Red Sea. Instant, you know, it's interesting when I think about this. God didn't lead them through the the short way, directly to where they're going. He took them a different way. He took them a different way with a purpose, right? He took them a different way with a purpose. Listen, it says, the Israelites went up out of Egypt ready for battle. They're emboldened. We're moving. We're not in this. We're not under this oppression. We're not doing this work for these people anymore. We're out of here, and we're bold as can be, right? Let's go. We're out of here. But God already is on the move, and he says, I'm not taking them straight on in there this way because they're going to end up in battle, and they're going to freak out, and they're going to go right back to where they came from, right? So I'm going to take them another way with a purpose tied to it, but they have no idea. So Moses took the bones of Joseph with him because Joseph had made the Israelites swear on an oath. He had said, God will surely come to your aid, and then you must carry my bones up with you from this place. After leaving Sukkot, they camped at Etham on the edge of the desert. By day, the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way, and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so they could travel by day and night. Neither the pillar of cloud by day nor the pillar of fire by night left its place in front of of the people. So now they've got to talk about a divine escort. Amen. They're following a cloud that's just, we just have to just walk along. There ain't nothing to see here. Just keep moving. Follow that cloud. And at nighttime it gets dark. Boom. It's fire. Follow that fire. And they're moving along and they have God's clearly, clearly his guidance on what's going on. We go into chapter 14 of Exodus. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn back and encamp near Piahiroth, between Migdal and the sea. There are to encamp by the sea, directly opposite of Balzephon. Pharaoh will think the Israelites are wandering around the land in confusion, hemmed in by the desert. And I will harden Pharaoh's heart, and he will pursue them. But I will gain glory for myself through Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. So the Israelites did this. Well, you know what? It's, it's so interesting. When you hear what's starting to unfold here is that they're going a particular way. They've got a route that they're taking, and there's already this plan in place. God's going to harden the heart of Pharaoh, and he'll pursue them. God is going to harden the heart of Pharaoh, and he is going to pursue them. When the king of Egypt was told that the people had fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their mind about them. What have we done? We have let the Israelites go and have lost their services. All right, there's God doing something with a purpose behind it. And it, to anybody on the onlookers, they think, wait a minute, did he not paved the way for them to, you know, the exodus, to leave, right? He, he created a way for them to leave, and now this is unfolding, and it, and it sounds like us. It's like God is doing something in our life. You know, we hear scriptures, I share them all the time, that are soapbox scriptures, you know, consider pure joy when you go through trials of many kinds, because the trying of your faith 
develops perseverance, right? We hear that. We hear it all the time and we don't realize God is purposeful. He has a plan in the midst of ugliness. We'll look at it and go, well, certainly God's not doing anything with this. Why in the world would he, why would he have Pharaoh coming out? He's the one that created the, the circumstances that allowed him to release him in the first place. And I'm going to tell you, you might want to just consider something that it's not about Pharaoh, it's about those who need to enter the promised land. There needs to be a work that happens in them because where they're at's not going to cut it. God already had to deal with them and their departure. He had to take them a longer route because they couldn't handle going straight in. When the king of Egypt was told that the people fled, Pharaoh and his officials changed their minds, and he said, what have we done? And then he goes on and says, we have lost all those, our services are gone. He says, so he had his chariots made ready, and he took his armies with him. He took 600 of the best chariots along with all the other chariots of Egypt. you got a posse here. With officers over all of them. The Lord hardened the heart of Pharaoh, king, of Egypt, so that he pursued the Israelites who were marching out boldly. Well, they they were bold. Remember that? They were bold. They were marching out boldly. They didn't have anybody pursuing them, right? Then the Egyptians and all Pharaoh's horses and chariots, horsemen and troops, pursued the Israelites and overtook them as they camped by the sea near Pyaroth, opposite of Balzephon, as Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up. Listen to this. This sounds like us right here. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up, and there were the Egyptians marching after them. They were terrified. Sound familiar? Start looking at our circumstances. All of a sudden, I'm terrified, and cried out to the Lord, they said to Moses, listen to this, I love this. This is, you talk about the guy getting thrown under the bus. Listen to this. They said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you brought us out to the desert to die? What have you done to us bringing us out of Egypt? <whistles> listen to this. They're not done there. Listen to this. Didn't we say to you in Egypt, leave us alone? Can you imagine? These are the same people that were moving along in bolded, remember? They're cruising along. They're happy. There's nothing to see here. All of a sudden, they look behind them, and the guy's under the bus. They're driving over the top of them, right? Leave us alone. Let us serve the Egyptians. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the desert. You know what? When God brings us to a place to challenges us to trust him he always allows our circumstances to crush in on us right he allows us to have to trust him to do what only he can do and i'm going to tell you you know what the what the purpose of that is you know what the whole the whole concept is for us in the day that we live in today right you know when you think about you know we are the salt of the world we're the light of the world right and when we think about being a light in the midst of darkness, or as it says, Paul said that we're like a bright and shining stars in a dark and deprived generation, an illumination that is seen vividly clear. And you know where it's seen? It's seen in oppression. It's seen in circumstances that requires God to show up. And that happens when we allow him to work through us. And you know what that requires out of us? Faith. Faith in action. It requires us to respond knowing, knowing what? Knowing what? Knowing before the foundations of the earth, he knew me by name. Knowing, knowing what? Knowing that this whole concept of, you know, our redemption, the reason Jesus came, that we would know that eternal life is us to know God intimately and to know Jesus Christ in whom he sent. What's the significance? The significance is the fact that his love for us was so great that he said, what holds us apart from him is this sin problem. He says, I'll pay for it. 
Then he says, but you know, I'm not interested in just a get out of hell free card. I'm interested in a relationship, a legitimate relationship. And I'll show you to what extent I'll go to rescue you. Now I'm asking you to be in the game and go rescue someone else. Are you with me? So they didn't get this. They don't get this. They don't get this. And their man, the, the one that God has called in this, they don't get it. And they throw him under the bus. They run him over a handful of times. Amen? Listen to this, though. Moses answered the people, Do not be afraid. Stand firm. And you will see the deliverance of the Lord will bring you today. The Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord, the Lord will fight for you. You need only to be still. Faith in action. Faith in action. They're there. There's no question. They're there. That threat you're looking at, they're there. That's reality. But God is bigger than your threat. We think that everything catches God by surprise, and we were laughing about that earlier, about God not being caught by surprise. That the circumstances that happen in our life, that he's completely aware of. Now, we have our own free will, and there's people that do a lot of ugly things in this, on this planet Earth. And God uses all of it for his glory, if we let him. If we let him. And so as we press on and we, we understand there's a lot of circumstances, for instance, you got an army breathing down on you. And they, they have very foul intentions. Number one, they want to take you back into captivity, and if you're not going, you're not, you're not going to live. We're going to kill you. That's pretty hairy. So Moses says this, you know what? Stan, watch this. Right? And I love... I love, listen to this. Then the Lord said to Moses, why are you crying out to me? Tell the Israelites to move on. I love it. You guys, do you think you were brought to this place and God's taken a nap somewhere? you got a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire at night. He just kind of said, you know what? There's layoffs. You guys go home. I don't know those guys wandering around. They'll figure something out. Do we think that in our life? That God forgot about us? You know, I've told you guys a story a lot of times <clears throat> in-house here, but I don't know if, any, if you've heard it here or those who are watching on Facebook of a story of, you know, God just putting on Rhonda's heart to take some food into Morris, to this Hispanic family. <clears throat> and we were out there, we were out there to visit these people already, and there's no speaker, right? So I'm out there, and there's no speaker, and there's 10 of them in this house. I'm thinking, well, this is going to be an exciting visit, right? She's adamant about it. We've got to take this food there. So we load up, and we take this, we're heading to Morris. We get, we get all the way there. And we're, we're two blocks from the house, and we go past this. These people are in the front yard, and they and they're, you have this little yard sale, and, and they got all this, this remnant carpet square. Nothing. A bunch of nothing. And we invite, my heart hurt inside me. My heart hurt. And so as we passed, I didn't say anything. We get to the house. There's nobody home. Now, we come back around the corner, and Rhonda speaks, and she says, we need to stop and talk to this lady. So I pull up at the curb. So we get out, and, and we've got a, a, a pickup truck, and we've got food in it for 10 people, right? And so this lady is sitting there, and she starts trying to sell us remnant carpet things and all this. I said, we're not here for that. I said, we got some meat, and we've got some food in the truck. I want to know if you could use some meat. She's like, how much do you want for it? I only have a few dollars. I said, no, 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 we want to give it to you. We, we want to give it to you. It's in the truck right now. And this lady starts crying, you know, she starts crying. And she's like, she's like, I was just sitting here asking God, have you forgotten about me? Whew. Boy, unpack that before a preacher to see what happens. I said, no, he hasn't. You forgot about him. And then we got to, to have this conversation. It was amazing. And, it, and, and to go into detail, I'm not going to do it right now, but I'm just going to tell you, we got a divine appointment 
that God wanted to communicate to some poor child that he loves deeply, that somehow lost her way and just needed to come back home. She cried out and said, have you forgotten me? He said, absolutely not. Have not. We got to be on the receiving end of being that, to respond to that, right? So when you, when you think about the circumstances that go on in our lives and, and the fact that God is purposeful and he allows things, that, somebody, somebody has to have a, dry, a drought before they, they want the living water, right? They have to have hard circumstances before they realize that Almighty God has you in the palm of his hand. The circumstances that, that come into our life, if we see them the right way, then we respond in a way that's honorable to him. And also, it illuminates him. And when we comprehend that, the circumstances that happen in our life change radically. Because now I'm not a victim anymore. I'm excited. I'm a victor. Because the God of all creation has used me to speak into somebody else's life. Are you with me? And what perceived to be pointless somehow has found great significance. They didn't get it. God speaks sternly. Tell the Israelites to move on. He says, listen to this. Raise your staff and stretch out your hand over the sea to divide the water so the Israelites can go through the sea on dry ground. And I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians so they will go in after them. And I will gain glory from Pharaoh and all his army through his chariots and his horsemen. The Egyptians will go in and we, the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord and I will gain glory over Pharaoh and his chariots and his horsemen. Then the angel of God, who had been traveling in front of the Israel, Israel's army, withdrew and went behind them. And the pillar of cloud also moved from in front and stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness, brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. So neither of them went ne near each other all night. Listen to this. Then Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And all that night the Lord drove the sea back with a strong east wind and turned it into dry land. The waters were divided and the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and their left. The Egyptians pursued them, and Pharaoh's horses and the chariots and horsemen followed them into the sea. During the last watch of the night, the Lord looked down from the pillar of fire in the pillar, uh, uh, the pillar of fire in the cloud, at the Egyptian army, and he and he threw it into confusion. And listen to this. I just this you know this this part right here. Listen, it reminds me of an old bewitched episode or something. When you hear this, it's crazy. It's crazy, because you imagine crazy things are happening, they're just freaking out, right? Listen to this. Listen to this. He says, he says, he says that the wheels, he jammed the wheels on the chariots so they had difficulty driving, right? He threw them into confusion. So the Egyptians said, let's get away from the Israelites. The Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. Imagine the guy that heralded that out. The, the, the wheels are jamming on the chariots. Things are going crazy. They're confused. The guys are running into each other. It, it's like a, a picture of Three Stooges. And somebody, somebody in the crowd, as there was, and I, I've often thought this same thought about those who were in the garden when Jesus was arrested before the crucifixion. You know that some of them soldiers, some of them soldiers knew that the God of all creation was shaking that ground. They knew, they knew all hell was getting ready to break loose in the same way. These guys are in the water, they're, they're following along, they see these pillar of clouds, it's like this is supernatural stuff, guys. Pharaoh, keep going, keep going. We got our finest chariots, let's go, get, get these guys. Off they go, and a whole prideful group of people end up in the middle and they start crashing into each other, and somebody just voices it and says, hey, listen, guys, Cut our losses. Let's get out of here. God's fighting for these guys. 
What has to happen in our life before we realize he's that purposeful in your life if you'll let him be? He'll fight for you. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand over the sea so the waters flow back over the Egyptians and their chariots and their horsemen. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea and at daybreak the sea went back into its place and the Egyptians were fleeing toward it and the Lord swept them into the sea. The water flowed back over and covered the chariots and the horsemen and the entire and, and the, the entire army of Pharaoh that followed the Israelites into the sea. Listen to this. Not one of them survived. Do you remember what Moses said? See these guys behind us? You will never see them again. You will never see them again. Not one of them survived. Was it, the Israelites went through the sea on dry ground with a wall of water on their right and on their left. That day the Lord saved Israel from the hands of the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians lying dead on the shore. And when the Israelites saw the mighty hand of the Lord displayed against the Egyptians, the people feared the Lord and put their trust in him and in Moses, his servant. Well, I like to come down on the floor and just, let's, let's just tie this thing in a bow. Think about everything you just heard. A people that were captive, God takes them out of captivity, knowing how frail they are, he provides for them guidance that's as graphic as can be, a pillar of cloud day and a pillar of fire at night. He provides for them everything they need. And as they travel, their leader who took them out of there, the voice that said, hey, here's this is a good idea, let's do this, God's going to take care of us, gets thrown under the bus because... Things start to look by our physical eyes like we're not going to make it. Wait a minute. Things were going smooth, but now we're, we're at this place, and, and now they're right behind us. And, and, and so let's attack our leader. What's that even about? Let's attack our leader, the one that's heard from God, the one that's responding faith in action. I'm going, to, I'm going to tell you that we're going to do this because this is what God's called us to do. So now it requires, listen, it requires faith to move forward right now in this moment. Because this problem behind us is too big for us. You think it's too big for us to put a pillar of cloud there? And a pillar of fire in there? I don't think we had that in our little bag of tricks either, did we? But, but to understand, this is real. Listen, do you know, the circumstances of our life, when we think in terms of making altars of remembrance and things that God has delivered you through, when you come up against a hard time, you look at it, you know, you see the victory. Why? You seen David, what did he say? When he, when he looks at Goliath, he's looking at something, obviously I cannot take. I can't deal with this guy myself. But he said, I slew the lion and I slew the bear. And he knew he didn't do that by himself either. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine? Right? We know, that, we know how that ended, right? Didn't work out well for David when he was wearing one of, I mean, when, for Goliath when he was wearing one of David's pebbles in his forehead, right? David runs up, pulls the sword out of his sheath and cuts his head off with his own sword at the hand of a mighty God. And so when you think in terms of our life and the circumstances that God's trying to take us through, he's given us example after example after example of how he leads us to places that are immovable within ourselves in order that he can show his power. And when he shows his power and we understand it's him, we become emboldened, not like the Israelites were when they were leaving, they were emboldened just because the circumstances were changing and the scenery looked cool. 
But when some pressure got put on them, man, they shrank back right away. Do you understand when the pressure gets put on, when you understand that God's got you, you know what happens? You, you become emboldened in the toughest of circumstances. And that's what he's looking for. You know why? Because that's the evidence of his power, right? And the Apostle Paul said, I didn't try to, he didn't try to appeal to them with eloquent words, right? But with the power of God. Is to understand that our circumstances, the life circumstances that you find yourself in, much like them, God's trying to take you out of captivity and put you into what he's provided, but you're going to have to understand there's going to be some giants in the land. There's going to be some waters that need parted. There's going to be some requirements for you that you're going to have to exercise faith. And you know what the amazing thing is, is when you, when you understand all of it put together and you understand that God requires us to exercise faith, but then he says, yet if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you could tell that mountain to uproot itself and cast itself in the sea and it will obey you. So now, now you're on a journey. Now you're on a journey and God, God's got a plan. And it requires faith. So he takes you to a place that you have right in front of you, maybe a mountain that needs to be moved. Maybe there's a body of water that needs to be parted. Maybe, maybe there's circumstances in your life that you perceive that are not movable. They're impossible. Some of you would say tonight that you have circumstances in your life that are impossible. And God says, all things are possible with God. All things. And so to understand to look at our obstacles and look at the, the direction. First of all, is, is, you know what? I tell a lot of people, I read scriptures and I'm a hard guy to listen to because I hit with a club. The reality of it is, is don't, don't kill the messenger. I'm just bringing the word, right? So if you don't like what you hear, it's God. I'm just, I just deliver it, right? So when you understand if God wants to do something in and through your life and you get your toes stepped on, don't get angry. Maybe you want to move your foot. Maybe you want to take another look at what he's trying to do and understand he's not caught by surprise by anything. And that the circumstances that you find yourself in allow him to lead and guide your steps and then walk by faith. Amen? Watch where you end up. So this is interesting because on this journey of faith, I speak from years and years and years of being discipled. And I realize as I'm speaking to a lot of people that, you know, come to faith in the Lord is that they don't have the biblical, you know, upbringing. They don't have the, 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 the teaching in the word for a lot of years. So I speak of things sometimes that maybe you're unaware of. Let me just say this. When we started out here this evening and I shared about the fact that Jesus came into this world, right? That we would have this eternal life. And eternal life is knowing God the Father, the one who spoke things into existence. And Jesus Christ, his son, who died for us. Amen. That we can have harmony in a relationship. Amen. That's where the journey begins. Right there. So if you're, you're at a place that you don't, you never had a time in your life where you've said to God, God, I am a sinner as described in Scripture. You know, incidentally, the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments. The Bible says the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. So if you're guilty of one, you're guilty of all because the wage of them is a penalty. It's a penalty you cannot pay on your own. But praise God for Jesus who paid it for us. So if you've never received what Jesus did on the cross, it begins there with forgiveness, and then he wants to take it to the whole motivation behind, you know, Emmanuel, Jesus coming at Christmas, the name Emmanuel, God with us, the whole meaning of the whole thing is that he would know us and we would know him. Amen. There's one last verse that horrifies me. It's found in Matthew. It said, many will come to me on that day and say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Did we not cast out demons? Did we not perform miraculous signs? And Jesus says, away from me, you doer of iniquity, I never knew you. He wants a relationship. 
It's not one-sided. Do you hear what I'm telling you? The problem with the Israelites, they were being led, but it was one-sided. They're following and they have no trust, no nothing. We now, we now have the indwelling Holy Spirit of God available to us when we receive that forgiveness that he provided. The Bible says, the Bible says you're born again. Flesh gives birth to flesh and spirit gives birth to spirit. We need it. If you don't have it, you need it. It begins there, but if you, if you ask the Lord to rescue you and, you and you're redeemed, and your journey is something that everything you do is measured by your own abilities, man, you're out left field. Because God wants to display Christ through your life, and if you can do it within yourself, they're not seeing Jesus. You hear what I'm telling you? You're on the, ball, you're on the wrong ball field. The only way they're going to see Christ is when your actions require faith. Then they're going to see Jesus. Sometimes, you know what that looks like in our life? Sometimes it looks like us keeping our mouth shut when we would have blasted somebody. That, that's for me. Quick tongue, wise guy, right? And sometimes the Lord says, you know what? Shut up. Grace and mercy right now. Just shut your mouth right now. Amen. And you know what? Somebody from my past, you know what they'd say? That's not the same guy. That's not the same guy. Very obviously something different has happened here. And the evidence of a God in heaven is seen with a submissive spirit to what God's doing. Sometimes God's saying something that's big. Sometimes he's asking something big out of you. Sometimes he's asking you, you know, he says, you're, you're pursuing something in life. He says, you know what? That's no more. I used to do auto restoration. I was very good at it. You tell me I'm not interested in auto restoration. You're a preacher. You're going to leave that. My point is, whatever it is, whatever God wants to do in and through you, are you, are you willing? Are, are you ready to be taken out of, you know, captivity and, and have the exodus where you, you leave a different way of life and, and then you, you follow him as he leads your path? And when obstacles come, you don't throw the preacher under the bus. And you say, God, I, ju I just want to do what you've called me to do, and I want to do it with faith. Maybe we'd be like that soldier that asked for his child to be healed. And, and he said, if you can, and Jesus said, if I can. The reality of it is, is Jesus said, if you have faith, all things are possible. And he says, I have faith, but would you help me? Would you help me with my unbelief? I do believe, but would you help me with my unbelief? Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe you have unbelief. Maybe, you're, maybe misbeliefs in your life have given you unbelief. In other words, you believe something about God that is not true. And, and as a result, you have a problem with belief. Whatever it is in this time of invitation, we always give one, give you an opportunity to respond to what you heard. Do it. Counselors, why don't you come up? Love to pray with you, whatever it is. As the music plays, say yes to God.
Father God, we thank you for this time. God, I pray that our hearts that have been challenged here tonight would step out with faith and action. God, that we would trust in you to conquer that which we cannot conquer on our own. Thank you that you love us. Keep us safe. As we press forward, God, help us to not look behind us and be concerned. Help us to look forward, above, and understand that you've got us. We love you. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. You're dismissed.